Hey guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show. We give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today is John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie-related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California, and it's a Hellboy kind of day. Mm. Also here is John Schnepp. That's right, mate. It's a Hellboy kind of day. <laughs> My frontal lobe has absconded. <laughs> also, here is Perry Nemiroff. We got two Perrys. Two Perrys today. Thank you, Ray. I love this. I'm obsessed with it. Perry, you got to put pictures of that up I will, on your social I will. media I will. I know you guys can barely Ray see it. Ray made a great pop <laughs> of Look at the Perry back, And the back of it has the coming soon ghost figures of Mark uh. Riley, Adam Smith, <laughs> Ray Hancock, <laughs> Ashley Nova, Ray Orr, ladies and gentlemen. Ray, you're amazing. Woo. I love you. That's amazing. Also here, Mark Ellis. I have a uh, pop toy that Ray made for me a couple years ago. Now one of my best friends has two kids, and they they both are asking for Mark Ellis pop toys. Aww. Then they don't want to meet me. They just want the pop toy representation <laughs> of me. Toy version better than real version. All right. Well, a whole bunch of stuff to cover today. Ashley, what's up first? Breaking last night and shared on his Facebook account, Hellboy creator Mike Mignola announced that Stranger Things' David Harbour is in talks to star in an R-rated Hellboy reboot directed by The Descent and Game of Thrones director Neil Marshall. The project goes by the working title of Hellboy Rise of the Blood Queen and has a script by Andrew Cosby, Christopher Golden, and Mignola. Both Guillermo del Toro and original Hellboy star Ron Perlman are not involved in the project. Marshall is now developing a new script with Aaron Collette, who worked on NBC's Heroes and is also working on the new Star Trek Discovery series. No release date has been set. John, thoughts on an R-rated Hellboy reboot starring David Harbour? Love it. I think this sounds great, especially when you consider the team behind. But first of all, Mignola's still being involved with it. That's key. You look at the, the producers getting involved with this thing. That's pretty key. And look, I know there's going to be a lot of fans out there that go, but we wanted Hellboy 3. I, I get it. But Guillermo del Toro wanted $200 million to make Hellboy 3. No studio is going to give him that because, you know, the, the, those movies just don't make that much money. So instead of just letting Hellboy, the character, just sit and gather dust on a shelf, give it an R-rated reboot and go for it with the core creative team. I, I actually really like this. Now, I'm a little mixed on the actor. I thought he was good in Stranger Things. I'm not as high on him as a lot of other people are, which is fine. I have no problem with him, a little mixed, but you know, who would have thought Ron Perlman at first would right. have become the incarnation of Hellboy, much like Hugh Jackman became the incarnation of Wolverine. So I gotta tell you, overall, I think this is positive and good news. What do you think, Perry? It's tough. So I do love David Harbour. I think he's, he's gonna be great in this role, and I think he can be great in just about anything they cast in. I also love Neil Marshall. The, de the Descent is one of my favorite movies. He directed one of my favorite episodes of Game of Thrones. However, when I think about Hellboy, I think about Ron Perlman and Guillermo del Toro, and it's not like we haven't been talking about Hellboy 3 in the past months even. It's not like this is a project that's been dead for so, so long. It still feels so fresh in my mind, and it still feels like just yesterday that we were sitting here saying, oh, maybe they will finally make Hellboy 3, and I was still trying to picture that. So I don't know if, that, if I have enough distance between me and that idea right now to really embrace this, and also because, I mean, you guys know I love love Guillermo and I am well aware as are many people that Guillermo had so much freaking passion for this project so I don't know even though I think that they can make a great R-rated reboot at the same time it's hard to be so so excited about this because you know G Guillermo didn't get to complete his vision and that's a bummer. Schnapp. Well I mean yeah there's a the devil's in the details I mean I it's $200 million to make a Hellboy 3. That doesn't equate box office wise. I would have loved to have seen it, but I feel like just like Sam Raimi's Spider-Man, we got Guillermo del Toro's Hellboy. Now we're gonna get another person's interpretation of Hellboy. And that's just the way comic book characters are. Comic book movies are the same thing. There's different writers and artists for comic book series. There's different writers and directors for movies. And I think it's great. I can't wait to see Neil Marshall's interpretation of Hellboy, to see an R-rated Hellboy, to see a different version, maybe a little bit like darker, more macabre. It's gonna be way different than what we've already seen with uh, with Guillermo's Hell Hellboy because he's got a stamp. All of Guillermo's movies have his, have his essence in them. So they feel like a Guillermo film. I'm looking forward to seeing a different version of Hellboy, and I think one that maybe is truer to Mike Mignola's comic books. So I think it's a win-win. Yeah, I mean, I would have been excited. Don't get me wrong. I, if they came out and said, you know what, they bridged the distance, right. Guillermo is going to do a Hellboy 3. I would have been excited sure. about that. But The Descent is like 
my favorite horror movie of the last 20 years. The, my, the only horror movie I like more that is, that is more favorite is the original American Werewolf in London. Mm. That's my all time favorite horror movie. The Descent is right up there. And the, I think it's time for, and we got to keep in mind too, the first Hellboy, as much as we may think Hellboy is such a huge, successful franchise, the first Hellboy made under $100 million right. worldwide. The second Hellboy, big sequel, worldwide made $160 million. Right. I mean, so it's not like it, it, there was a business case to be made for sticking with the original letting Guillermo finish his trilogy. I think they would have let Guillermo finish his trilogy if he said, I've, I've got this idea for this movie, my budget's gonna be $75 million. They sure, they would have done it. But if there's no other option, then you got to move forward. I know. How do you see all this, Mark? John, you say whatever the hell you want about me the rest of the day. But between the hours <laughs> of 10 a.m. and 11 a.m., I'm nothing if not an optimistic, positive guy. <laughs> so I'm going to put a nice spin on this because it is an R-rated comic book film. And we really like those in Hollywood right now. And again, this is Mike Mignola's project. This is his property. This doesn't belong to Del Toro to Ron Perlman. So if it's his right to take it somewhere else where it can actually get made, as opposed to sitting in development hell forever, I applaud him for making that decision. And I think David Harbour is a great choice to be playing Hellboy if you can't get Ron Perlman. Personally, Perry, I'm more bummed that Ron Perlman can't play this character again than Del Toro being involved with it because this is two teams sticking to their guns. This is the Hellboy creator saying, I want to make more stories in my world. And it's Del Toro saying, I don't think we can do that for under $200 million. So my only question is, when you see the first two Hellboys, I didn't love the movies, but the imagination that is just dripping off the screen in every frame is so awe-inspiring. I hope that they can do that, or at least in this new version, give us something else to glom onto as fans, because I think this is a character that deserves to have a new franchise relaunch and not just one standalone movie. All right, what's next? Warner Brothers and Alcon Entertainment unveiled the very first trailer for Blade Runner 2049, the highly anticipated sequel to Ridley Scott's 1980s sci-fi classic. Directed by Arrival and Sicario filmmaker Denis Villeneuve, 2049 takes place 30 years after the events of the first film and stars Ryan Gosling as a new Blade Runner, LAPD Officer K, who unearths a secret that leads him on a quest to find Rick Deckard, played by Harrison Ford. Villeneuve reteams with frequent cinematographer Roger Deakins with original Blade Runner writer Hampton Fancher uh, penning the script alongside Logan co-writer Michael Green. Blade Runner 2049 opens in theaters on October 6th. John, what do you think about the first trailer for Blade Runner 2049? Uh, look, most people know I don't care about this movie. Uh, <laughs> I, I am uh, I am one of the I am one of the few people. That, look, a lot of my friends who I adore and are much smarter people than me love the original Blade Runner. Most people I know do, but I can't, I'm not going to lie and just pretend that I like something that I don't just so I can be one of the cool kids. I did, I've never liked the original Blade Runner, and I, I know that makes me the odd guy out, and I'm perfectly comfortable with that. And the first trailer was stupid. The first trailer we're done. Remember, we did. Uh, we were in New York City when we did our coverage of the first trailer. And I thought you were crazy for saying yep. it looked stupid. It, lo it was a neat-looking teaser. I uh, no, I thought it just, if you took out that title, that was a bad trailer. You put on any other title, and that nobody says anything about it. I really like this trailer. What can, what can I say? I'm, I mean, I thought it was. I, I was expecting. I put on the trailer, expecting to go. Here we go again. This is going to be blah, another. But it's like. No, this is compelling. It's actually, this trailer is actually character focused. And I got into it. And the visual, I mean, so they clearly captured the visual style of the original film very, very well, but they updated it at the same time. But I actually got into it as a movie, as a preview to a movie, I really got into it. So I can say whatever I want about the fact that I didn't like the original, I'm not really looking forward to us. I got to call it like I see it. This was a damn good trailer. And it actually, for the first time, got me interested in this movie. So top marks, it was a good trailer. Yeah, and, and like Campy, I don't feel the need to just blend in with the cool kids and say, oh, I love Blade Runner, but I will tell you this. Still haven't seen Blade Runner, John Schnapp. I mean, <laughs> no, still haven't seen it. So no. I, I apologize in advance, but I'm going to watch it, maybe even this week. And this new trailer had me dreaming of Electric Sheep because unlike the Ghost in the Shell trailer where I like the visuals and I never, I was like, I'm not sure what the story is, but I kind of want to check it out. This was so compelling from a storyline perspective, from a character-driven piece, getting to see Ryan Gosling and getting to see Harrison Ford, obviously. And it's so nice to see that Jared Leto has made a quick recovery from the broken heart he suffered yesterday at the hands of our own Ashley Mova. So everything about this trailer, visually, but also more importantly, the way that they opened up the plot and let us know this is something that we're going to be exploring in this film without giving away too many details. I thought it was a magnificently done trailer. Schnepp, you had a chance to see it. What did you think? 
I loved it. I mean, I was very trepidatious about seeing this trailer because I'm one of the nerds who loves Blade Runner, like Scott Mance. I've seen it like probably 50 times. I've seen all the versions. It, it stopped tweeting me like, which version should I see? The final cut. That's the one you got to see. Then go to the theatrical version, then see the other three versions. There's a lot of versions. <laughs> Just see the final cut. Stop tweeting me about it. It's the final cut. Anyway, <laughs> trailer. I really thought it was fantastic. Yeah. You know what's great about it, though? It's obviously in the hands of someone people not just one person a group of people who love the first film but are making a new a new version of it a new yeah. movie because uh roger deacon cinematography is on point it's it's up front and yeah. you see the symmetry and the way that denis uh, villeneuve wants to direct and showcase it's almost kubrickian like some of the shots yeah which are not like the way ridley scott directs so I loved seeing the different, the big wide landscapes with lighting and the way that they, they use textures and coloring that's so different from the dense, highly packed version of Blade Runner or i.e. Alien or the way that Ridley Scott likes to design his sets, which almost create a claustrophobic world, like that kind of world building versus minimalist world building, which is what Denis is approaching with this film. I love the storyline. I love everything about it. Can't wait to see it. Perry. You're not alone. I'm not a big Blade Runner fan oh, either. Wow. And the sad thing is, I really want to love it because I'm surrounded by so many people who do really See, love I'm it. I'm the only and person on this panel who actually likes Blade Runner. All these well, other well, people. I, I, I'm the, I, I might. We, we just don't know. It's too early. It's too close to call right now. Snap, if I want to fall in love with Blade Runner, which which edition should the I The final cut. Oh, the the final cut, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, the final cut. I might have watched the wrong one. I don't know. I don't know what I watched, but I tried to watch it quite a few times to really get into it and give it a chance, but I never have. And even though I've never really been that into Blade Runner, when that first teaser trailer came out, I kind of liked what I saw. I, it was one of those things where it was such a short amount of time and we got such a small amount of imagery in it, but every single thing had something to say, and it was eye-catching, and it kind of pulled me in and made me interested in the world. And the same thing is true with this one. I love the fact that there's a lot in there where you can connect the dots between this new version and the original, so there's lots of stuff for fans. And then it also feels like it's its own thing. It feels like it's based in the original, but it's also something that is going to open the door for newcomers or for people who didn't really like the first one and might like this one. Obviously, it's great seeing Harrison Ford and Ryan Gosling back, but I am so excited about Mackenzie Davis in that movie. Mm -hmm. When she popped on the screen, I was so excited. And then also... Um, Ana de Armas, who was in uh, Eli Roth's Knock Knock, but more recently she was in uh, Hands of Stone with Edgar Ramirez. Right. She was so damn good in that movie. So to see her have a bigger role in this, uh, I'm pretty pumped right now. Uh, can I ask you Blade Runners a question? So when you see this trailer, does it feel like the first movie to all y'all, or is it like something totally different from what you saw in the first one? World-wise, it it, it's, it's taking you back into the world. I mean, it, it feels like it is unmistakable. As soon as you watch one frame of this, world-wise, you're there. But I feel like this one, it feels like a different story. In other for me, but it it does definitely they do a great I'll job bringing you back. I mean, for me, world wise, it feels like a meshing of the two worlds. It's definitely not Ridley Scott's Blade Runner. It's a different version of Blade Runner, a different world, so to speak, because of even though it's reminiscent, where you have that kind of lighting and there's people on mo on bikes behind Ryan Gosling walking, which is very reminiscent of some of the scenes from the first Blade Runner, it's cleaner. If you look at the backgrounds, the streets don't have that dirt and that kind of grime. They don't have those tubes everywhere. It's flat walls. It's it's a different approach to the design aesthetic. So for myself, I like it. It shows you that 30 years have passed. Yeah. Something has gone on in the world. It's still kind of a just depressing, weird, dark dystopia. I'm very interested to see the approach as to where the world has gone and how replicants and humans, you know, because they're in the trailer, they're kind of hinting at a um, upcoming war between humans yes. and replicants. So I'm very interested to see what the entire story is going to be about. All right, what's next? Variety is reporting that Russell Crowe is in talks to play legendary attorney Clarence Darrow alongside David Oyelowo in Arc of Justice for the Mark Gordon Company, directed by Narcos Helmer Jose Padilla. Based on Kevin Boyle's book, Arc of Justice, a saga of race, civil rights, and murder in the jazz age, the true story centers on a racial incident in 1925 Detroit that puts African-American doctor Ossian Sweet on the stand for murder with his defense funded by the National Association 
for the advancement of colored people led by Darrow. Godzilla and Kong Skull Island writer Max Borenstein, along with Rodney Barnes, penned the script with a release date yet to be determined. Mark, thoughts on Ark of Justice starring Russell Crowe and David Oyelowo? This would have been an easy buy for me, Ashley, but we're not there yet, I don't think. So I'm just going to say mm -hmm. I really want to see this movie. I want to see the town involved, and I also want to see the true story of Darrow because this case was such an advancement for the NAACP, and the way that this thing comes together, particularly with Crow playing Darrow and then the talent that you have involved in front of the camera, it's something that I want to see. It's interesting to hear that... Godzilla and, and Skull Island writers are like going to be doing this biopic, but <laughs> now this makes me believe that Godzilla and King Kong could actually be true stories as well. So <laughs> I really want to see this movie anyway. I think it's been a while since I've seen Russell Crowe really sink it, his teeth into something mm -hmm. that has as much you know meat as this. So it might be a comeback to form for him. And obviously, uh, yeah, well, we've seen the acting chops that he brings to stuff that we already like, like some. I mean, he's amazing in that. So I'd like to see more from both these guys. If you're going to put together a recipe of a potential movie that John Campia will really be interested in, semi-period, true crime story based on real life events with who I, what I consider to be the best, the second best actor in the world right now with Russell Crowe and one of the best up and coming actors in the world right now, David Oelowa. Uh, this is it. I mean, this, I mean, you throw on top of that a great director who clearly knows how to tell character driven narrative very, very well. This is, there's nothing but shine and gorgeousness on this for me. I cannot, I'm drooling at the mouth actually to see this movie. I cannot wait for this. Very. I'm, I'm curious. I'm really excited. I like the the two actors that could potentially be locked for these roles and I think it's a it's an important story to tell I'm curious how far they're gonna go in terms of making it a character specific story versus its effect on you know the country and the world but you know an example of that remember Mississippi burning was a great example of a film that was incident scoped but very character driven at the same mm -hmm. time I'm hoping they can bring that same kind of I hope to there's this. a mix because this this story is is pretty damn dark it's not like yeah. he mm -hmm. he wins the case and frolics off into the sunset and things change he this poor guy did not have the best life after spoiler, after all this was set. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you go, it's, it's, it's history. You can go you can go on uh, Wikipedia sinks. and read up, yeah. read up on it, but it, it's it's going to be a challenging story to tell and watch. And I'm really curious to see what they do with it. Schnapp. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to echo everything you guys said. I mean, they got two actors who who do the best bio roles. You know, it's like mm. just you know, it's kind of an Oscar bait when they like announce really this is. kind of stuff. They're like, all right, well, I guess this. It seems like it's being uh, it's being made to win an Oscar. You know, I mean, I'm interested in seeing the story told. It's a dark part of our history, you know, and it's always interesting to me to see uh, as we continue to move forward with still dark parts of our history right now to see. You know, it's always a reflection where you're like, this happened like 60 years ago. You know, this happened 40 years ago. This happened 20 years ago. To see the changes in our world and some things that are stay the same. You know, so. I'm still saying biopic, and I gotta like, I can't get it out of my. It, it, it's definitely wrong the way I'm pronouncing it. Yes, right. There's, that no, sounds there, there, there's not like a tomato, tomato. Even if you say tomato, though, even that's wrong. Mark, so. I gotta go to the doctor to get a biopic. Okay, <laughs> I got it. biopic. Go. Biopic. That'll make you change your mind. Biopic. All right, guys, it is Tuesday, which means it's uh, the day we like to look at what is going to be coming out in theaters this week. There's a couple of wide release ones. We're going to focus on one, starting with. Ashley? King Arthur, Legend of the Sword. When young Arthur's father is murdered, Vortigern, Jude Law, Arthur's uncle, seizes the crown. Robbed of his birthright and with no idea who he truly is, Arthur, Charlie Hunnam, comes up the hard way in the back alleys Curtain. of the city. <laughs> but once he pulls the sword from the stone, his life is turned upside down and he is forced to acknowledge his true legacy, whether he likes it or not. Yeah, our production crew keeps pulling surprises out of the hat. That's right. I, I didn't know where we I thought Graphics. I liked that. That was pretty Ooh. cool. Things. Ooh, we are advancing. Um, look, I believe this film is still under review embargo until no. tomorrow. No, it lifted this it morning. It did lift this oh, morning. Yeah. Great. Okay. Really? This is a. Are yeah, we they sure? sent, I'm positive. I have an email. Oh, they sent it to me. Okay, so they lifted it early. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, there was a review embargo until tomorrow. Look. Uh, I am a big fan of Guy Ritchie. Everybody knows this. Like, Lock, Stock, Snatch is one of my favorite films of all time. I like what he did with Shock Holmes. I love Man from Uncle. But even I was like, this King Arthur movie looks like it could be kind of iffy. Yeah. And I uh, honestly, I went into it with very mixed expectations. I was very happy. I came out very happy. I really thought this was a very cool, different 
interpretation and incarnation of this old story brought to life. There's some definite Guy Ritchie-isms in there. It's, there's a couple of scenes of dialogue that were so snatch. Mm. Like, that were just so, like, just beautifully. It was fun and engaging. I think a lot of people are going to be very, very pleasantly surprised. Like, I'm not, this is not going to be best movie of the summer or one of the top ten films of the year, nothing like that. But I think a lot of people are going to be very pleasantly surprised by this film. I actually got a lot of a big kick out of it. I recommend you go and check it out this weekend. What about you, Perry? There are a lot of Guy Ritchie-isms in this there movie. Are. And that that's working to its benefit because I feel like with his style, you could have a really crappy movie in many ways, but because he is so good at creating these crazy visuals and just this rip-roaring pace from start to finish, it's almost hard not to have fun with it. And there's beats of it that feel like a music video. There's so much energy, <laughs> even though it's a super surface-level story and also in terms of character development, too. There's, there's really not much more than what you would expect from these characters, but it's still fun to look at. It's still exhilarating to watch. I'm, I'm happy I saw I, it. I will say, though, I was surprising how much dimension they actually gave to the Jude Law character. Because the more and more that movie goes on, I was surprised by the, by the different aspects they showed of, of his. But anyway, Shep, you have not seen this movie I've yet. not. Where's your anticipation level at these days? It's medium style. Yep. You know, like, uh, but you know what? I was very happy when you guys saw it and you were like, hey, we were actually really liked it. I was Because the trailers didn't do anything for me. I'm a big Excalibur nut. Right. How does this, on the, on the Excalibur sword level, where does this fall? Dude, that honestly, that's like asking, you know, okay, so when you're watching Schindler's List, how does that compare to the Transformers? Like where, I mean, they're, it, they really are such radically different films. Both what I mean, what it's, King, it's King Arthur. That's what I'm saying. The, it in is the world King Arthur, King but Arthur. it's such a different King Arthur. It's it's hard to explain. The it's only thing, I, there's magic in there, right? Because when there I saw is it, magic. It, it felt like when I first saw the first couple trailers, it was like, where where's the, it's the sword and the stone. This is magic. I, that There better be magic. There's magic. All right. There's a lot yeah. of magic, actually. There is a ton of magic, and this is one of the better King Arthur biopics that I've seen <laughs> recently. Um, I, was, I was stunned how much I enjoyed this movie because I, there is some trepidation going in because you just don't know how it's going to fit with Guy Ritchie's style on a King Arthur story. There's a lot of Guy Ritchie in there, but there was a lot of mythology. There's a lot of magic, a lot of mention of mages. There's a lot of spells. There's a lot of visual imagery that is so dreamlike and it's so different than what I thought you could do with a King Arthur story. So not knowing how the worlds were going to collide, I thought they did it so well. I didn't love everything about this movie. I thought it either could have been 20 minutes short or even 20 minutes longer, but it's something that not only I can recommend you check out in theaters, but I also say once the Blu-ray comes out, it's that rare time when I actually hope that they add 30 minutes or 40 minutes to a director's cut, you know, because I think it can enhance the story that much more. It's worth throwing some corn in your face and checking out this weekend. And as far as the sword itself goes, this is a really cool interpretation of Exc the Excalibur sword itself. Uh, I like the, what they did with it cool. there. All right, guys, we reached out part of the show now for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of her, Ash, she's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down, and then those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So, Ashley, what do we got? Paramount Pictures released a new clip from their upcoming Transformers The Last Night. The clip features an old, old World War II tank Transformer trying to shoot at Mark Wahlberg's Cade character with Anthony Hopkins' character claiming the tank has a robot dementia. Transformers The Last Night makes use of the logline, the hunted will become heroes, heroes will become villains, only one world will survive, theirs or ours, and is due to hit theaters on June 23rd, 2017. Perry Byers sell the new clip from Transformers Last Night. Dude, I am selling Dude. this clip so hard. Dude. And you know what? Dude. I was kind of open to it. I really do. Even though I'm not a big fan of the Transformers franchise overall, it's that does not mean that I want this movie to be bad. I'd love to have fun with Transformers again, but this is weird. And even that other TV spot that they released today with the, the secrets thing. The secret the secret history yeah, of the Transformers. Yeah, the secret history. Yeah. I wanted to like that too, but there is something so weird about Transformers being involved in important events in history. And we just, it, it's a secret history, really? I don't know. I'm not really liking much of anything that I'm seeing so far. And... Ah, I want Anthony Hopkins to have a really interesting role in this, but when he said, when he said, dude, he lost me, and then Mark Wahlberg in this scene. I, I don't really know what he's, do he's think, doing in this either. I he knows either. what he's doing in this at all. I mean, I will give them some credit, though, because I do think the visuals look great. Always. They, they clearly continue to nail the Transformers, the actual transformation, and the sets do look good, so, like, 
that's something. I, I can just picture Michael Bay going, okay, we just we just landed Sir Anthony Hopkins in the movie. I need a line where he calls Mark Wahlberg dude. That's got to be in there. That's the money right. shot right there. Um, look, you know what? First, I'll start with the secret history of the Transformers video that came out. I'm going to say it's the first thing from this movie I've looked at and thought, that's interesting. It's interesting. Does it make any sense? No. No, no, no sense at all. But their approach to it and the design of what they do as they go through the different periods of history and things like that is actually really kind of interesting. Then you see all these portraits and stuff like that, the, design, the samurai ones and things. It was actually pretty cool. Okay, now let's actually go to the clip from the movie. That's stupid as hell. I mean, like... The robot with dementia comes right out of the dangling testicles on Constructicons. Yeah. I mean, it just it, it just felt so lame. And like Mark Wahlberg is standing there thinking, doing that M. Night Shyamalan movie was better than this. I mean, he's just got that look on his face. I have, look, for me, I adore, I grew up with the Transformers. I love the Transformers. I really enjoyed the first movie. And I'm desperate for them to get back to greatness. I'm gonna go into this theater, seeing this movie, hoping that it blows me away and renews my love for the franchise, but I don't see it happening from the clips I've been seeing up to this point. Mark, what about Well, you? allow me to turn those frowns upside down because John Schnepp and I have a new wrinkle to our Transformers 5 drinking game. Every time Anthony Hopkins says, dude, you take a shot, oh. we're going to be taking a lot of them watching oh. Transformers the last night. This movie uh, does not look good. But I like the secret history thing because that reminded me of what they did with X-Men, um, whether it's like, you know, Apocalypse or Days of Future Past or whatever. They had some promo material that came out that's like, oh, Mutants maybe factored into history here. So getting to see how the Transformers might have factored into history. It's a fun walk down a very perverted memory lane. And I like that. This clip, not so much. I'm sure Anthony Hopkins is enjoying doing the backstroke and his gold coin fountain that he made <laughs> being in this movie. But it just doesn't look like they're going to be able to utilize him any better than the Transformers series has been able to utilize any actor that's been in there. They just become part of Michael Bay's bastardized version of what John Sh the Campy and I loved playing with his kids. Uh, dude, dude. <laughs> Shall we just say a couple of things about this trailer about dude, all right? Dement uh, robots with dementia, a little walk, another dog, a friend walking a dog. And Anthony Hopkins and Mark Rawlbuckers cashing checks. <laughs> I see it in the face, the check, in the money, and they say things. <laughs> That's it. The check and the money, and they say things. That's the next T-shirt. That is the next T-shirt right there. <laughs> oh, man. All right, what's next? A new trailer has been released for Absolutely Anything, a comedy that stars Simon Pegg and Robin Williams as the voice of his faithful dog. The movie also has the distinction of being one of the last feature films to feature the Monty Python crew working together. The film has found distribution through Atlas Distribution Co. and follows a school teacher played by Pegg who was granted the power to conjure absolutely anything by a band of scheming aliens played by Monty Python's John Cleese, Eric Idle, and Michael Palin. It is set for a limited release this Friday, May 12th. Schnepp, buyers sell the new trailer for absolutely anything. I'm going to have to buy this. I know it's probably been sitting on the shelf for a while. It's got Robin Williams' his last role, but it's got the Monty Python crew. It's directed by Terry Jones, and that's why I was quoting that earlier. My frontal lobe has absconded. <laughs> that's what he said about he's he actually it really does have dementia. Mm -hmm. That could be one of the reasons it's taken a while for this film to come through. It definitely has a, a God, a Bruce Almighty, you know, it's got that kind of that flavor to it where it's like, you know, oh, I can do whatever I want. Anything I can think of comes to life. But I'm going to give it a shot. I actually laughed out loud. Uh, there one one moment in that when he's like, ah, you know, bring all the dead back to life. And it just made me the laugh. Zombies. That one shot, I la laughed out loud. Uh, so I'm looking forward to seeing it. You know what? Uh, I remember us covering not this exact trailer, but a trailer to this movie that was very similar to this, I think four years ago really? wow. on Movie Talk. I mean, I, I could be wrong, but I believe this film was made in 2013. I think it's actually been sitting around a wow. very, very long time. But you know what? I thought it was clever. I thought it was cute. You're right. That scene when he says, everybody who died, bring them back to life, and the zombies come. When Robin Williams is locked behind the door, and Simon Pegg is there with Kate Beckinsale, and you just hear Robin Williams, you know, Shagger, Neil, Shagger! <laughs> I, I was giggling and laughing. It's like, do I think this is going to be great? No. I think if this was a great movie, this is one that would have come out years ago. So I don't have high expectations, but I thought the trailer was really cute and clever, and it's 
going to be emotional, I think, hearing Robin Williams on the screen again. It's going to be very cool hearing the Monty Python guys doing something like that. But uh, I'm going to give it a buy. Perry. I think this was uh, shot in 2014, and it might have opened in other territories because there's a bunch of reviews out, and they're not that great. I didn't really read them too too in in depth. I read like the opening paragraph, and it doesn't seem like the general consensus mm -hmm. is very good for this one. But I mean, just judging the trailer, I really like the concept, and I really like Simon Pegg. If you pair those two things together, I think you could have a lot of fun with it. The only reason I'm not going to buy this trailer, though, is because I didn't laugh out loud. I thought, oh, it is clever to do this with zombies. It's clever to do that with a dog. I thought it was clever to do it with the president bit. But really, when I was thinking about it, and I rewatched it even, I mean, I didn't, I didn't laugh. So really, what's the point in having all those cool, crazy scenarios if you're not going to get to laugh out loud? Uh, Perry, allow uh, yourself to put on the rose-tinted glasses that the rest of us are looking at this trailer with. What am I going to do, not buy it? It's got the Monty Python crew in it. It's got Robin Williams and Simon Pegg. Of course I'm going to buy this thing. I watched the trailer. I didn't laugh a lot, but I smiled the whole time. And you're right. I'll probably get emotional watching the movie. I was a wreck. Night of the Museum 3, the last third of that movie, I was openly like weeping. It wasn't like the single tear coming down. It was literally bawling. Like People were looking at me, just openly weeping because you're watching Robin Williams on screen for the last time and so getting to hear him one more time I think is so great it's it's going to be emotional I think this movie is made for kids so hopefully kids can go there and enjoy but the parents that take their kids to see it can say oh my god that's the Monty Python guys that's Robin Williams so there's something in here for a lot of people it's going to cross generational boundaries I don't know if the movie's going to be any good or not but I got to buy the trailer all right, what are we got? We got another one. What's yeah, next? Did. It's been six years since Joe Cornish's Attack the Block came out in cinemas, wow. and now, via a report from the playlist, Cornish is finally set to direct his sophomore film, The Kid Who Would Be King. Word broke about the project from casting director Jessica Ronan, who posted the announcement on Twitter. Cornish will team with working title for the film, described as a family fantasy action adventure movie about a band of young kids embarking on an epic quest to thwart a medieval. Evil menace. Filming is set to start in late summer with a release date set for September 28, 2018. John Byrasell, Joe Cornish's second movie, The Kid Who Would Be King. Also known as Attack the Medieval Block because <laughs> there's a lot of things that sound very similar. I remember a lot of us got very excited when we heard that there was a potential that Joe Cornish, I believe, was offered the latest Star Trek film mm -hmm. that they did. And that didn't work out. And that's fine because the movie actually ended up being really good yeah. regardless. But it would have been cool. It is really odd hearing you say it's been six years since Attack the Block. That feels absolutely weird. But look, this sounds like a clever movie. I uh, Sure, I don't, before, without seeing a real more in-depth synopsis or seeing a trailer or anything like that, on its surface, this sounds good. I'm going to give it a buy. Yeah, I mean, a family fantasy action adventure, a band of young kids have to thwart a medieval Venice, th th a menace that might be Decepticons? Huh? <laughs> this movie is going to be so much better than Transformers the last night. It's medieval. There's bad guys. Let's have Joe Cornish do a Transformers movie. Ah, until he gets that, I'm definitely going to buy this as his sophomore effort. What's weirder to hear than it's been six years since Attack the Block is that Cornish hasn't directed another movie since then, so it's Very nice to odd, see him yeah. have another film and one that he clearly is excited about. Schnapp. Well, I remember uh, he got stuck on the Ant-Man train of like working on He right. was writing That's it with right. Edgar, and yep. then they, they spent a lot of, of years working on that, and then that fell apart. Uh, he's also been on a lot of other development hell trains. So, I mean, Joe Cornish, uh, Joe Cornish uh, I got introduced to him through Holly. Uh, his Adam and Joe podcasts are some of the funniest things. If you want to check it out, Adam and Joe, look it up, laugh your ass off. He, the guy is a, a genius. So that he's only made one film so far bums me out. I cannot wait to see this. This reminds me almost just in the storytelling of the you know the plot, it could be almost time band, it's like a time band yeah. style thing. So. I freaking love Attack the Block. It was my <laughs> yeah. favorite, one of my favorite movies. I think I ranked it number three of that year. I have a huge Attack the Bo Block poster in my apartment. I love that movie. You could have said Joe Cornish directed anything and I would have bought the story, but I know we're joking about, oh, this sounds a little like Attack the Block, but you know, if you switch up the location and you switch up the fact that, you know, the the Attack the Block movie had some had some pretty rough humor in it. And now he's doing something family friendly. I think it's probably a good way to kind of hold on to what he does best while also switching it up a little. And this is a huge opportunity for him. I know he hasn't just been sitting on his ass the past couple of years, mm -hmm. but it is about time he gets to direct another movie. I'm so psyched for this. 
All right, guys, so I want to remind you that this is not the only show on Collider Video today. We got a whole bunch of stuff coming up. Last night, a brand new episode of TV Talk dropped. A little bit later today, John Schnapp and his crew, crew for Heroes goes live at 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. That's 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Keep your eyes open for that. And also want to let you know that a little bit later today is a brand new movie trivia showdown title match going on. Here's a quick peek. Looking forward to taking down the Wolves of Steel. Bring them on, because I'm going to tear them to pieces. Do you want all the belts? Fuck yeah, I want all the belts. Let's go get all the belts. Get all, the belts. all right. <laughs> all right, so that airs a little bit later today. Keep your eyes open. Also want to let you know, our Alien Covenant review went online the other day, so if you want to see a review for that movie, go check that out. And of course, every Friday, brand new episodes of Awesome Tacular with Jeremy Jones on the Verizon Go 90 network. You're going to want to check that out. Now, we also do this show live, and at the end of the show, we're going to save a little bit of time to take some of your live Twitter questions. So if you're watching us live, start tweeting in some questions to at Collider Video. Just follow us there on Twitter, send them on in, and Wendy will pick a couple out near the end of the show. But before we do that, we're going to get to our mailbag segment. Look, if you've got a topic or a question, you like, or maybe even a gripe, you want to address to us here on the show, just email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. Now, Ashley thinks we're going to do one question, but I'm throwing that question out. We actually have another question that came in from the fans. Now, you know, you got to know, we love our jobs, but sometimes there's little parts of our jobs that are interesting, to say the least. Getting emails like this is one of the interesting ones, and I'm going to read that now. So here's an interesting question that came to us from Edward A. Do we got a graphic? That? Yeah, here it is. Edward writes, Hey, John, first of all, I love all the Collider shows and everything you guys do, but I think you guys really did something unclassy with announcing Ashley's engagement yesterday. Oh my God. A lot of us are loyal fans and had no idea that Ashley even had a boyfriend. <laughs> so... To suddenly announce that she's oh engaged God. was pretty underhanded. Wee. Misleading your audience isn't cool. I still love you guys, but in the future, you should really keep us informed. We expect better. Well, wow. somebody had to say it. If I could blush, I would, but I'm too tan. <laughs> well, then how dare you? How dare you have a relationship? Um, this is so awkward. <laughs> totally underhanded, Ashley, pretending I mean, that you're single to, to the millions hey guys, of dudes. Well, by the way, hey guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk. Me and my boyfriend the other night. Like, this is not, it doesn't have anything to do with the show. It's so weird. I, I remember, that this reminds me of of two stories. <laughs> one I've told a couple times, one I have never told. So the one I've told a couple times, I tell the story about once a year, but one of the, the greatest ridiculous emails I've ever gotten from a fan, well, this was back when I was doing the movie blog back in the days, and I got this email from a fan. This is when they were getting ready to do the Hobbit movies, and this fan wrote, hey, John, uh, I'm a big fan of The Lord of the Rings, and I live in New Zealand. Can you please send me Peter Jackson's email address so I can ask him if I can be an extra in the Hobbit movies? So, I mean, I get emails like that all the time, so I just ignore it. Three days later, I get another email from the same guy in all caps. It's, I asked you for Peter Jackson's email address three days ago, and I've heard nothing from you. What kind of customer service is this? <laughs> so, yeah, that is by far uh, one of the best. But then I was about a year ago, I got an email saying, hey, John, uh, I've, I've, I'm a real big fan of the show, and I'm a big fan of Sinead DeFries. Uh, I've got something I'd like to send her. Can you please give me her, her mailing address? And I just ignored it and stuff like that. And they got this angry email back. You've completely ignored me. Email. This is how you treat your fans. I just need to be a fan of somebody else. It's like the, the wow. amount of craziness out there. I mean, look, 99.99999% of all the email we get from our fans is amazing, great stuff. But we do get ridiculous things like this once in a while. <laughs> Seb, what is, like, can you think off the top of your head one of the craziest or most ridiculous emails you ever got from a fan? Uh, I just... I put them into like two categories, just normal people who are like, hey, you know, it's like, dig what you do, or I want to do what you do, or how do I do what you do? And the kind of the questioning want to 
you know, that, that kind of person who's either likes what you're, you're saying or, or likes your opinion and wants to emulate that or wants to either follow a pathway, like maybe they want to write a book or they want to make a TV show or something, so they're asking for some kind of assistance. And sometimes, um, you know, if I get an email like that and I have time, I will quickly answer it. But usually I don't because it's just you can't answer, like, hundreds of emails like that. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, sometimes it's they overreach a little bit, you know, and uh, I'll just leave it at that, you know. So I think, <laughs> you know, I think, look, that Ashley is engaged is pretty awesome. I think that's what you, anyone watching this should be happy for her. And you know, remember, you're like in your bedroom or at your office room watching us right now. We don't know what you're doing. <laughs> we hope, we really hope that you're happy for all of us. Oh. Uh, okay, well, I don't really know where we go after that. So, and to think I was going to ask to go to the restroom like while the camera wasn't on me, but I'm so glad I was here. For that. Wait, keep the camera on Ashley for a minute. I can still fantasize, can I? Oh, no. Wait, look at the way she's laughing. I, she's not engaged now, is she? Oh my god! Wait, gosh. she still is. I see the ring. Oh, now I don't gosh. see the ring. I'm so embarrassed. Oh, uh, when you get us out of this, please. Uh, what's what's going on in Twitter? Boy. All right, well, John Smith. I don't know how to transition from that either. John Smith writes. Cliff Curtis has joined the Avatar sequels. What are your thoughts? I'm sorry, who? Cliff, Cliff Curtis. Curtis. He's from like Fear of the Walking Dead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, 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 I did honestly. I hadn't heard that. Um, I'm sure there's going to be about 50 actors joining the Avatar, you know, anthology of 47 right. films that may or may not ever actually come out. So right. <laughs> I'll, I'll have a reaction to it once I actually see a trailer. Uh, Cliff Curtis is a really good actor, though. I enjoy him on Fear of the Walking Dead, which that show isn't the best, but he really he's. He's one of these people that can be in subpar material, and he elevates it. He never brings less than his A game, and I expect nothing less in Avatar. So, hey, by the way, uh, John, I'm glad that we're on air talking about this. Can you get me James Cameron's email address? Because I think I'd be a great extra in Avatar. So if you can just hook me up with that, that'd be great. I would, but he specifically mentioned you by name to not get no, his what? contact. No. I don't know what was up. I said, John, what's up? Because John showed personal. me the email. It said, avoid Mark Ellis at all costs. And you were all caps. You guys weird. don't. That's Jimmy's sense of humor. But or it, buddy. it also said, however, if Ashley Mova is still single, <laughs> right. Right. Said, oh, right. maybe he's the guy who sent that email. Yeah, and maybe you, he was sent, you totally there. sent James Cameron her email. You were like, all right, I got to. It's James Cameron. You're like, you know. James Cameron is going to CJ that ring right off. That's right. Code will be be broken this summer. <laughs> um, anybody else on Avatar? Uh, Avatar 2049. Yeah. yeah. Uh, cool. <laughs> I like him as an actor. I don't really know what this. The it says the New Zealand-born actor will play. I can't pronounce this name. Who is the leader of something called the Reef People Clan? Yeah, Balatik. Balatik. <laughs> no. I love it. Balatik. All right. What's next? All right. This one comes from Jeffa Snow, who writes. Currently, King Arthur has a 7% on Rotten Tomatoes, despite good wow. reviews from media like yours. How is that possible? Uh, seven, wow, the last, because last oh time I checked I it had... I just checked it. It's, it's got a 7%. 5. The last time I, when I checked it at first, it was a, like at 61. <laughs> so must have drove like a thing. Look, uh, no movie is for everybody. All I can say is that when we went to go see it, uh, coming out, it sounded like most of the people who were there actually enjoyed it. I don't know if they went in expecting something else, but hey, look, that's the beautiful thing about movies, man, is the subjectivity of it. Just because, just because I don't like Blade Runner doesn't mean you shouldn't like it. Just because I do like, you know, Star Wars doesn't mean you should. I mean, it, movies affect everybody differently, and that's just where it is right uh, now. So I we didn't got, love uh, it like you did, but I'm shocked to see. Do you? Are you looking at the I'm, ratio? I'm looking at it. We got we got one fresh review, and we got 20 rotten reviews. Wow, not a great number to start out at. But like somebody wrote us this a couple weeks ago. They're like, well, like do do movies tend to go down? from what they open with on Rotten Tomatoes, do they tend to go up? And it's one side or the other. So if it starts really low, it's going to go up from 5%. It may never become a fresh movie, but if my score is anything to say about it, it's certainly going to improve the 5%. So you got that going for you, King Arthur. <laughs> All right, what's next? Patrick writes, what canceled movie project were you most looking forward to happening before it fell apart? Mine is Raimi's Spider-Man 4. Ooh. Good one. Yeah, uh, that, I know a lot of people will will probably say the Halo project that mm. Peter, the aforementioned Peter Jackson was going to be a and producer Neil on, and Mia Blomkamp mm -hmm. was going to direct. Uh, that was really in the works for a while. Um, those are really two biggest ones that stand out to me. Can you guys think of I've any? got one. It's a little movie called Superman Lives. Oh, wait a minute. I made a documentary about it. It's called <laughs> The Death of Superman Lives. What happened? And you could get it at tdoslwh.com. Coming from the Wayback Machine, son. 
But see, if, they, if that did come, then we wouldn't have gotten the documentary. You're right. So it's a, it's a double plus win. So screw that movie. All right. Yeah, I'm glad the documentary <laughs> exists. But I would have still liked to have seen that. As, as much as I love you and your documentary, seeing Nicolas Cage as Superman would have been something pretty special. There was uh, a lot of rumors and a lot of buzz around the like 2007, 2008 period that there was going to be a Point Break sequel. Yes. And it was going yeah. to be directed by Jan DeBond, who did Speed. Wow. Patrick Swayze was going to reprise his role as Bodie, like he survived somehow. And you know who they were in talks with to do the musical score? Young man named Edward Van Halen. This all actually <laughs> happened. And I really want to see that movie to this day. I don't know if this is a canceled movie, but I really did want to see a Dread sequel. That was one movie where I saw it yeah. the first time, and I didn't really like it. And then I watched it again and again, and I started to love it. And I really wanted that sequel. And I don't know if it was ever at the point where it could have happened and then it was canceled, but if there's any possibility, I'm still yeah, rooting for it. No, I don't think that'll <laughs> ever happen. There, Unless it's like a straight-to-DVD sort of thing with a, a $500,000 budget or something. All right, let's take one more. All right, this one comes from Robbie Haskell, who writes, what is the single best use F word or <laughs> any other swear word in a movie? I'm sure there's a lot, but you know what? A, a friend of mine and I, uh, you guys know Corey. So Corey and I, uh, we were uh, eating somewhere, and it came up that she had never seen Last Vegas. Hmm. Now, Last Vegas is a little comedy that was out a couple of years ago with Robert De Niro and uh, yes, Morgan I know where you're Freeman going, yeah. and stuff yeah. like that. And I just adore the movie, so we went and watched that. There's this great scene in it where Michael Douglas, Morgan Freeman, Kevin Kline, and Robert De Niro are in line at a club uh, in Vegas. And the guy comes up and says, the only way you're getting in is if you get bottle service. And he's like, how much is that? He says, 18. He goes, well, fine. He pulls out $18. No, no, $1,800 for a bottle of Grey Goose. And then Kevin, there's a moment of pause and quiet. And then Kevin Klein, just perfect timing. F! I mean, but he doesn't say F, right? And uh, that that moment just really, it, it's it's hilarious to me. What Can you think of another one? Las Vegas, Kevin Klein is great in that movie. Yes, he is. Um, I can think of two off the top of my head. First of all, the greatest <laughs> use of swear words by a human being I've ever seen. Go back and watch Mr. Show. Bob Odenkirk is so good. Whenever he hits an F-bomb, he knocks it out of the park. The movie I'm thinking of actually has two of my favorite swears of all time. That would be the legendary Spaceballs. One is when Dark Helmet is trying to go to ludicrous speed and it doesn't work. So he opens the thing and it says and it says it's out of service, and he says, F, even in the future, nothing works. <laughs> the way he hits the F-bomb is so good. The other one is Mel Brooks as President Scroob. He's on the phone with some sort of talk show, and he's assuring everybody that the air quality is just fine, and he hangs up the phone, and I say this all the time when I hang up the phone with somebody. He's like, okay, thank you, and bye-bye. <laughs> Shithead. It is the way he says it. It's so good. I'm going to say, of course, Mel Brooks. Check it out. Um, I'm going to go with X-Men. Uh, Days of Future oh, Past. Oh, yes, uh, Wolverine. Uh, the Wolverine line. <laughs> that uh, was uh, first great. class? Yeah, first class, <laughs> yeah. and then and then the, the rebuttal by Xavier. Both of those are my favorites. I think one of my favorites is probably Risky Business. Sometimes you just got to say what the... Mm. Okay, can I say it? <laughs> yeah. I don't know, but sometimes I say that just out loud in my everyday life. And probably every single curse word in kick ass that comes out of hit girl's mouth because that's a good example <laughs> yes, yes, of so of curse words that actually you know enhance a character which mm -hmm. is kind of nice all right guys well that'll do it for us for this installment of the movie talk thank you so much for joining us listen if you like this episode make sure you click the thumbs up button leave a comment but also take this video share it around in your social media as well i want to thank the guys sitting at the table with me first of all over here gonna be back a little bit later today with heroes mr john schnepp schnepp where can people find you online you can find me on instagram and twitter just at john schnepp like at one like you said one o'clock live today heroes get some of those sweaty questions we're going to take some live twitter and uh, you can check me out on my youtube channel the schnepp zone Right beside me, Perry Nemiroff. I am on Twitter and Instagram, at P. Nemiroff, and keep an eye out for new behind the scenes this Saturday. Collider Beer Pong continues. <gasps> right here, we got Mark Ellis. Uh, Twitter, at Mark Ellis Live, and I'm recanting my previous statement. I can say uh, biopic. <laughs> because what do you call a, a ography of somebody who is actually lived? A biopic. No, you call it a biography. Biopic. Uh, biopic. Biopic. We are, not having this, we are not having this argument right now. Okay, over there, <laughs> the uh, 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 the attached, just to be clear, Aww. Ashley Mova. <laughs> you know, Perry, I'm really sad that you haven't invited me to play beer pong yet. Come on now. You're Okay, I'm not going to spoil anything for the future, but, but you are on deck. 
You're on deck. Now, nah, Perry just told me Ready. that because you're engaged, you're off deck. Right? <laughs> okay. It's like if they could get you drunk and take okay. advantage of you, okay. then perhaps you'd be on deck. But now you're taken. You're off deck. Off deck, Man. son. Man. All right. Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, Ashley Mova. Happy Tuesday. Yeah. Happy Tuesday, guys. <laughs> but the absolutely single and available Wendy oh, Lee. Oh, come on. Oh, you can wait. find me at the Wendy Couple channel on YouTube. Wait, why did you lie to me, Campia? <laughs> what do you mean, Wendy's married? <laughs> Have a good one, guys. <laughs> All right, you guys can simply follow me on Facebook and on Twitter and YouTube and everywhere else. Just simply at John Campia. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks so much for joining us. Until next time, bye bye. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.